Welcome to the University of Kent's Paris School of Arts and Culture and the third in our series of webinars, Interdisciplinary Interventions, Imagine, Reflect and Inspire. And this event also comes part of the MA Postgraduate Festival Unite Rebel by the University of Kent students in Paris. And we welcome you all to joining us for this webinar. I'm Jeremy Richard Corrette, Professor of Philosophy, Religion and Culture and Dean for Europe at the University of Kent. And it's great to see so many of you. I can see the numbers of you coming in from all, all parts of the world. Great to see the wide uh, connection of students present at the university, students who are planning to come, and also a network of our connections in Paris and around the world. Welcome to you all. First of all, just a, a few house rules so that you know what we're going to be doing. We have a Q&A um, session throughout the webinar and you are welcome to send in questions and we'll try to address as many of them as we can. And those that we don't have time to address, we will try and, and give you some answer after the webinar itself. So do send in those questions. In this series of webinars, we've been looking at the challenge of lockdown and the COVID-19, the way that it's changed our political landscape. I mean, our first seminars on Brexit and the political crisis around the world and the, and the government responses. But today we're asking a question around the humanities. It's virologists, biologists, and the medical sciences that have dominated the response to date. But in the media, we'll also see there have been questions around how the humanities can help, how philosophy can answer some of the moral questions, how literature has enabled us to survive some of the confinement, and how films have dominated our new lockdown life. To explore this set of questions of how the humanities is a vital part of our identity, vital in addressing some of the key questions of how we survive as a species as well as through the COVID-19 question. I'd like to introduce a set of pa panelists who are specialists in, in this variety of areas of philosophy, literature and film. The first guest I'd like to introduce is Professor Ben Hutchinson. He is Professor of European Literature and, and the Academic Director of the Paris School of Arts and Culture. He's published a number of books, uh, most recently, A Comparative Literature, A Very Short Introduction, and his latest book, The Midlife Mind, will appear this autumn. He regularly writes for various newspapers, including the Times Literary Supplement. Welcome, Ben. Are you with us? I am with you, Jeremy. Hi, good to have you this afternoon. And uh, the other guest today is Francis Gurin, who's the uh, senior lecturer in the history of art at the University of Kent and also lecturer at the Paris School of Arts and Culture. She teaches film and history of art at the University of Kent and has published numerous books and her most recent is The Truth is Always Grey, A History of Modernist Painting, which is uh, uh, won the Millard Mies Publication Prize by the College of Art Association. Welcome Francis, are you with us? I am here, thank you for having me. Great, great to have you here. And the final panelist today is Lauren Ware. She is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Kent. Her primary research is on the philosophy of emotion and works very much in public philosophy and media engagement, working at both the Edinburgh Festival and working on BBC and philosophy and public affairs, giving views on the emotional connection of fictional characters, amongst other things. She's written numerous articles in the philosophy of emotion, particularly in legal decision making, and her forthcoming works on emotion relate to the moral psychology of fear and a study of the Greek philosopher Plato on the erotic love. Lauren, are you with us? Hi, Jamie. Yep, I'm here. Great. Great to have you all here and uh, to see you all uh, for this webinar on the humanities and its relevance to COVID-19. I, th I want to begin by just opening up some of the key issues in, in relationship to how these subjects have helped us in lockdown. I want to begin with Ben. First of all, literature. We've, we've seen a lot of discussion ar around the kinds of texts that we might read during lockdown. Is it right to say that there is a particular form of literature which can sustain us in, in, in this particular crisis? I think it is right to say that, Jeremy, although I think that particular form of literature, in essence, is all literature. I think the key thing is that we're reading and reflecting on our current situation. 
perhaps I can just uh, wind back a little bit. To go back to your opening remarks, I think it is important that we, the humanities, participate in this broad discussion about our current situation. I think we've slightly been sidelined, and perhaps that's normal given the, the uh, medical emergency. But I think our situation now, as we can all see as I speak to you, is that we are reduced to talking heads. This is what we have. So what we have effectively is the life of the mind. That's what's left to us as we're under lockdown. So I think it's crucial then that we reflect on, on what that means and how we can live that in its, uh, in its fullest way. So to come to your question, literature, yes. Uh, what did Emmanuel Macron say when they went into lockdown in France? He said, lisez, read, go away and read. And I think that's something we can all uh, take on board. The question then is, what kind of literature? And I think I would want to begin by identifying perhaps four different categories of literature. The first one would be, perhaps the most obvious one, texts linked explicitly to the idea, to the history of the plague, different kinds of plague. Now, under that category, we could go all the way back essentially to the beginning of literature, back to Homer, back to the opening of the Iliad. Apollo sends a plague, paralyzes the Greeks. It seems like the Greeks are going to lose uh, the Trojan War. One could then come through, um, one could take Boccaccio, the Decameron, talking in the mid-14th century about the plague, responding to the plague of 1348. We could move forward to the, the, the 17th and 18th centuries, Daniel Defoe writing about the 1660s, the Great Fire of London and the plague then, Samuel Pepys as well. We can move forward to the modernist period, we can look at someone like Thomas Mann, taking the plague as a kind of allegory of decay and death in Venice. And we can look, most obviously, no doubt, at Albert Camus, Everyone's been talking about this text, the plague, la peste. So the whole different range of plague texts we could look at from across the centuries, from across the traditions. That'd be the first category, I think. And, 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 is, and is that <clears throat> largely because we require some identification to, to make sense of our own experience? I think that's right, uh, although I think that cuts both ways. I'm always slightly wary about this idea of identification. We do identify clearly when we read narratives, we identify with the characters. But we can also learn from things and from situations from characters with whom we do not identify. I think that's one of the things that history can teach us. And that we shouldn't reduce things to our own present concerns. And I think that was, that's one, perhaps we can talk about this later, that's one area I'd want to come back to, this idea of the humanities resisting this, this focus on the present. I think that in that well, first category then of the play, we could supplement that with a second category. If I can just briefly go through my four suggested uh, typologies. The second one would be after the plague, that of the prison. So lockdown, what does it mean to be in lockdown? How can we learn from his texts, historical literary texts that reflect on lockdown? Here we could go back to perhaps the most obvious uh, avatar of this, namely Boethius. Boethius writing his, his uh, Consolations of Philosophy uh, when in prison. We could then think forward to other famous, uh, very famous statements in the history of philosophy. Uh, people like Pascal saying that all the man's misfortunes come from not being able to sit still in his room. We could look at Descartes writing in his, uh, in, his, uh, in, his, in his small cabin. We could look at Sir Thomas More. We could look at Fernand Brodel writing his great study of the Mediterranean when in prison in the Second World War. All of that, I suppose, could be summarized with Hamlet's famous statement that I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. The third category I would lay alongside those first two, the plague and, and the prison, would be that of the prophecy. So the, the science, if you like, the science fiction, the dystopian prophecy of the future, what I call the grave new world, obviously playing on Aldous Huxley's brave new world, but we could also look at Orwell, 1984. Some people have been saying, just look at Dominic Cummings pretending to have predicted the future. That's one of the things they do in 1984. They predict the future once they already know it. This is, it seems, what Cummings has been doing. Uh, and the final category, and I think perhaps the most important category of literature would be everything else. <clears throat> I think it's important that we don't simply reduce our, our, our reading of art, of literature, of the humanities, to our current situation. That's one of the things that literature provides us with. It provides us with modes of thinking about other things. And I think it's crucial that we hang on to that, as well as simply thinking about texts that relate in obvious ways to our current uh, circumstances. Is, is, it, is part of our, our, our desire for literature to uh, escape the condition that we're in? Or, 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 or is it to, in, in some way, reconfigure the challenge this, that we face? Well, I think it's both that, isn't it? And no doubt for all of us in any given day and given different times, it's both those things. I think we want to reflect and deepen our understanding of the current situation. And we can do that through reading any number of the texts I've mentioned. 
But equally, and perhaps my third category suggests this, we want to escape, as you say, uh, transcend perhaps our current circumstances. I'll give you one example of that, and that would be in a strange paradoxical way, travel literature. The popularity of travel literature when we're locked down is, I think, very interesting because, of course, we want to escape. We want to travel elsewhere, if only in our minds, not in our bodies. Francis, if I may move to you, Macron is suggesting uh, reading, but in, 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 in many ways, one of the things that people have uh, discovered is new subscriptions to a, a variety of providers for online viewing. Um, and what, what are the kind of films that are also capturing people's minds and do they fit a similar typology to the literature that Ben is outlining? I it's an it's an interesting question, and I think. But as Ben, as I was listening to Ben talking, I was thinking how different the films that we're watching are from the books. Uh, when lockdown first arrived, the film apparently that everyone that was the go-to was Steven Soderbergh's Contagion, um, a film that is extremely prescient of our particular time. It's all in there. You know, the bat infects the pig and the, you know, goes into the, it goes into the kitchen and then the cook touches the woman's hand. And well, of course we're in Hong Kong, uh, you're in China, in the other world. And she he touches a woman's hand, interestingly enough, who's uh, had an affair or will have an affair or is having an affair. So there's this whole moral judgment. She gets infected. And before you know it, she has a layover in Chicago and goes on to, of all places, Minneapolis. And America becomes infected with this invisible uh, disease. And, and what's so much fun about the film is the mark, you know, it, it's identical. The masks, the R number, you know, the reproduction number. So it's in many ways a mirror of, of what we're going through. And interestingly, of course, is uh, isolation leads to violence, looting, and it's very similar to what's going on in the United States, even though, of course, it's come for different reasons or in a different way. Um, so there are films like that where we can actually see ourselves, but there are also other films, you know, of course there are films to escape to, but one of the most interesting set of films, I think picking up on Ben's categories, one of the most interesting set of films are films that are made in a single space. Because of course the medium itself is all about uh, moving through spaces and being able to to travel to take people through and across worlds and and different times and different uh, historical moments and and you know we can be in Chicago one minute and Paris the next and of course one of the greatest challenges for filmmakers in the 20th century was how do I make a film in a single space and some of the greatest films that were made in the 20th century were of course made in a single space and I'm thinking a film that many people will know uh, Hitchcock's Rear Window and how Hitchcock uses that single space like he's not um, he's he's of course broken his leg um, the, 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 the photographer who's broken his leg but the way that that uh, the single space then opens out firstly across the courtyard as he watches the woman on the other side of the courtyard and then of course into the streets of New York City as we hear the noises of the streets and so it's that sense of how do I get out of this single out of this kind of quote-unquote prison-like space um, and of course, Hitchcock was one of the masters of that. And then we have films, you know, a little bit later, Chantal Ackerman, the great French uh, experimental filmmaker, makes she uh, makes one of her very first student films uh, in New York City. She moves to New York City. She's depressed. She's not been there long. It's uh, early 1970s, and she makes a film in which it's called Ma Chambre, My Room, and the it's a it's a single it's a camera going around her room and we sense her entrapment, her depression, the repetition, the, the, uh, the, the, this sort of um, imprisonment, if you like, in her space, which I think a lot of people have felt, you know, uh, during the, the lockdown. So there's a different kind of isolation. Um, so there is... 
Go, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I just get the sense there in the comparison to, to Ben's comment that, that, that you, you, you partly get those people who are, think that, that this time was predicted or these, or these authors and these uh, directors captured something of our, of our time beforehand and the, the, the identification elements, that these, these, are, these are both working together. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, if I may move to, to Lauren, what is it about our, our, our emotional nature which needs to have a sense that we anticipated some, some of these, the, these events, and, and whether, like with literature and film, that f there is a philosopher that can give us that sort of comfort. If, if it's, it's something about the comfort of prediction, but also the comfort and solace of a philosopher. Can you give, it, give us some sense of, of who we might read in lockdown? Right, yeah, well, just in, um, in response to what you just said about um, the, the sense of, well, we predicted that, or look, we've got these films where the same thing happened. Um, I mean, I guess the worst case, well, uh, maybe not the worst case, but a very uncomfortable case would be something so abnormal and unpredictable that we're sort of paralyzed and wouldn't even know where to begin to analyze um, uh, or find a, a model of, of moving forward. So there might be that kind of... Um, finding a pleasure in films that have that look similar to our current state because it gives us some grasp of this is not so completely new that we're just completely lost um uh in terms of um philosophers that that i would recommend i mean i like um i definitely second ben's suggestion of boethius the constellations of philosophy was very um uh, important to me as i was an undergraduate sort of just getting into philosophy that was one of the that was probably the text that made me want to um move from, from political science to philosophy in my, in my postgrad. Um, and I guess that it's not really a genre, because again, I think it kind of feels like um, lots of really interesting philosophy does this, maybe most interesting philosophy does this, but just texts that make you um, reflect on what does it mean to be human? Who are we as humans? Who do we want to be as, as humans and as humans in a, in a society? And um, so the first text that I, um, would you know I, I think everyone should read this and especially um if it's starting to get nice weather wherever people are it's a nice text to read kind of um out, outdoors or or um in a in a sunny um, position um is plato's symposium and it's um it's short and it's these seven um it's a group of i mean that, okay, so it's almost the situation we have in Britain. It's seven philosophers, so one more than we're allowed to, to meet with today, but um, they, they're, they're having a kind of um, dinner party and get into sort of, well, what is love? And you get seven different kind of takes on, on what is love, a doctor's perspective, a very sort of clinical perspective of what's going on in the body. Um, it's kind of like sort of a playboy aristocrat view of, of love and a kind of um, celebrity type um, vibe. Um, tragic poet, a comic poet, and, and some others. And in, in Socrates' speech, some of the philosopher's speech there on, on love within that collection, um, I think paints a nice portrait that of kind of how important emotional connections to others and to sort of the wider world, including um, literature and, and, and science, um, is to, to what it means to be human. So Plato's Symposium, first recommendation. Um, and then um, Simone de Beaufort, the existentialist philosopher, French philosopher, um, her most famous text, The Second Sex, it's huge. So the symposium is a medium-sized, bite-sized. The Second Sex is quite large. Um, but in terms of trying to think through, um, I, there's been a lot in the news in the last month or so about these questions of, like, are we, are we fundamentally good? Are we fundamentally selfish? What are the types of things that are happening telling us about um, kind of fundamental human qualities, and and she has an interesting take on um, whether whether we have any kind of deep essential purpose um, or not, and it's a kind of um, it it's it's an interesting account of how we might try to figure that out on our own and not just import um, purpose from from others. Um, and then a very short recommendation uh, is Oscar Wilde's essay. You can find this on the internet. Um, quite easily, uh, his essay, um, The Soul of Man Under Socialism. Um, and it, uh, if some of the questions that we might get into a little bit later, you know, what are we, um, how might we transition into a post-lockdown world? Are there any changes that we want to make? Are there any things that we want to not stand for now that we've 
um, had this kind of odd experience, um, I think the, the beginning parts of that essay, um, he, he paints a picture of um, how we might respond to problems that we find, you know, abominable. Um, so, uh, th thank you, Lauren. I, went, I think we, we, we get there now, a, a, a collection of philosophical texts and films to read and, and, a, and an outline of potential literature that's going to guide us. We have a number of questions that are coming in and I'm pulling some of these themes together. And, and I'm thinking of, of this question of the value of the humanities. All of you have given that perspective of, of, of how it's valuable at this particular time. But there are kind of wider challenging questions for the humanities to have to deal with at the moment. And, and Sharifa from Malaysia is, is giving us one of those in the, in the very time that we found the solace of, of many of these kind of reflections from literature, film and philosophy, that the departments of philosophy, literature and the art history are ones that are being closed around the world. The economic impact is that we have driven to a set of subject areas where the priorities for the, the STEM sciences, though all the, all the business related courses that are going to generate income feedback into the society. Is the question of the value of the humanities not being articulated clearly enough? Because without the very things that we've discussed, we're in poverty as a human species. Ben, do you want to come in on, on, on that question of of the economic challenges to the subjects that we're um, discussing today? Well, thank you very much for the question. I think it's, it's a very important one. It's also a very big one. I'll, I'll do my best uh, not to rant here because there's always that danger. Uh, clearly, that's the case, isn't it? That the humanities are being squeezed just as we're now thinking maybe we need to reflect and step back in the ways that Lauren has just been so eloquently outlining uh, on the ways in which we might articulate a certain scale of values in our lives. I think it comes down to the question of the value of value and what we what we are prepared to fund quite literally but also what we're prepared to back and support morally as well as financially now i think as we look to the other side of lockdown as we look to, to the future and coming out of this particular unique unprecedented situation the humanities do have a very important role to play in, in articulating and identifying what these values are a lot of people are talking about this aren't they we need to think about how we can have have a different world after the lockdown from the one before but will it be different? Uh, previous uh, examples of this sort of experience, if there are any, don't suggest uh, any reason to be particularly optimistic, I have to say. When we've come out of previous crises, things pretty quickly tend to go back to how they were before. So I'm not so clear that that will be the case. I do think, though, um, on the question of the value of value, the value of the humanities, one of the crucial things the humanities do is that they resist what I, what I mentioned earlier, that's that notion of presentism to which we're all so prone as human beings, this focus on the present. And in a, in, in a crisis of this sort, I think is particularly acute and all the political and, and epidemiological discussions, of course, very much and understandably focus on our current situation, how we can deal with it, the sense of urgency. But the humanities, of course, have much longer breath, so to speak. We can take what the, what the historians call the longer durée. We can look over a long period of time, we can look all the way back to the past, back to antiquity, and crucially, we look into the future too. And I think that uh, thinking of this sense of the humanities as keeping open a continuum of values across the past, present, and future is, is really important. The, the, the English novelist G.K. Chesterton had this wonderful phrase, the democracy of the dead. And humanities, tradition, as he describes it, tradition can help us uh, protect and, and advocate and advance the democracy of the dead, that we shouldn't just, we wouldn't, dif we wouldn't uh, discriminate against someone on the basis of their birth. Therefore, we should not discriminate against someone on the basis of their death. And I think we can equally project that question uh, to the future too. So that's one of the things it seems to me that the humanities, the tradition of the humanities can give us, the sense of a broader, longer temporal continuum. Yeah, I, I want to keep hold of this idea of, of the value of the humanities, but I think Francis wants to come in very briefly just on, on a point on the future. But I, I, I want to pick up something about film in, in relationship to our present context. I was, thank you, Jeremy. I was just going to say what's interesting is 1918. Uh, of course, was the last time we had such a, uh, well, it's the comparable pandemic. And in film and the visual arts, the 1920s are the most creative, the most exciting, the most experimental decade in, particularly in Europe. And uh, one of the things 
of course, that we learned in the 1920s from the experimental film and art that was being produced in the wake, of course, of World War I as well, was seeing differently. And I think that certainly for the study of, of visual culture, seeing differently is absolutely critical to understanding the way that we act in the world and helping to see people differently. And so that's my slogan for the future, seeing, but, different, <laughs> seeing differently. So it's just- but I, a, but I guess, I, I guess yeah. the film is, is in a slightly different bracket. I mean, Ben is talking about the value of values, but the, the, there is a the value of the film industry, which, which fits a kind of e economic model that, 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 is be, that at the same time is being challenging to, to the humanities. Do you think that film is, is, is an access point to challenging some of those issues which displace the humanities, or are we all being forced into the industry of film to express the humanities? I mean, it, this is an interesting question, like the role of, and not just film, but of course visual media, because Film, what we see on, on Netflix and YouTube and is not necessarily film. It's also videos that are made specifically for an online platform. So the films, for example, that I was talking about before were not made for online platforms. So the question, I think we have to go back to the question of what's going to be produced by artists and filmmakers in the wake of this and it's going to be well i don't know what it's going to be but i would imagine there's going to be a focus on online which is different from putting your films online and or putting for example museums have really this is a personal opinion i think museums have struggled that yes they advertise their collections are online and come for a walk through the the metropolitan who actually does a pretty good virtual tour but it's not because the experience of being with an artwork is being with an artwork. It's not seeing it in reproduction. So we have to first think about, I think, what's going to be made in terms of visual culture for an online, for online. And then, of course, there's the question of how do we speak and how do we interact with the world online? Because going back to that question of value, not everyone has a computer or a safe internet connection or a space in which they can privately look at an image. You know, so I just think that the, the, it, that question that you ask proliferates into many, many more. Yeah, so I mean, it, it raises all sorts of questions about the digital humanities and how the humanities is played through that kind of particular medium. I, I, I'm just sort of thinking, Lauren, that, that, that in many ways, philosophy is finding a place in the, in the new public sphere and the value of humanities is being uh, recognised in philosophy. I, I, I note that it, in Germany during the pan epidemic, that the, the Ethics Council um, included philosophers and theologians to reflect on some of the normative kind of questions. And in, in, in that sense, philosophy does ha speak to our times and all times in, in, in trying to find solutions. So in, in one sense, the economic question that, that was placed by the question may not be so destructive to disciplines like philosophy. Do you think, do you think that's the case? I think what, um... I don't know if this is like a classic philosopher move, but I kind of want to just deny the premise that there is some huge binary between the sciences and and the humanities. Um, and, and philosophy has had this like interesting um, history in both of those things. I mean, what we call science is just like the, you know, the Latinized version of philosophy. It's just study, knowledge, wisdom, these types of ideas um, where someone studying, you know, how blood works um, in, in, in previous times would just be, they would say I'm doing natural philosophy. The study that I'm doing is of the natural world as opposed to the moral world or the social world or, um, uh, or, or, or literature or well not film back in those times, but you know, um, and, and so I think maybe some of the, yeah, sometimes animosity, but even just the tensions between, well, you know, which should we find? The sciences or the humanities or or should we balance the two um is is less a, a content distinction than a methodological distinction and if if there's a way of studying bodies and blood and the transmission of diseases um there are different methodologies to do that and if the methodology that you know 
we, we tend to talk more about in the humanities is asking questions where we don't know what the answer is going to be. And maybe some of the things that we don't know are how to measure it, but we kind of carry on and keep um, sort of setting out new questions as we come to the answers of the ones that we've just solved and kind of see where the, the, the interest goes, but also where the answer is direct. Um, that's a methodology that can obviously be used in the sciences as well. So kind of really looking at not which content or which questions or which subjects deserve more funding or are going to be more economically valuable, but uh, which methodologies sort of capture the human questions. That's an interesting question because uh, the, the, the questioner uh, framed it in terms of the departments which are closing um, and, and, and you've usefully kind of moved it into a wider methodological issue and, and maybe that, that it's the structure of the university and uh, that, that, that is the problem, that departments get associated with particular methods and if we could have a more interdisciplinary context then we might see a, a reframing of the intellectual questions and, and locate uh, the humanities inside other subjects by virtue of the kind of world that we're uh, uh, moving in and resi resisting the binary. Is, is, is that what you're, you're, you're opening up? I mean, I, I think that would be fantastic. And, and it, it's one of my favorite things about Kent. I wasn't here at the time, but Kent, you know, as a university, I think they, they were originally trying to be um, no departments, just sets of questions. And you'd get people that have studied different things, but are working on different questions all together. Um, and um, I think that's that's an academic trend that should be revived. Perhaps, so, perhaps, so, so ben, you want, ben, yeah, I can see you're nodding there. Do you want to come in? Perhaps I can just respond to that. Two pragmatic points. Uh, the first is that interdisciplinarity is, is great in theory, but in practice, it's, it's, it's very often different, difficult to fund and organize. People, it's the great god of our time, and people worship at the altar of interdisciplinarity. But when it comes to uh, funding grants and applications and so on, they very often get assessed in disciplinary rather than interdisciplinary ways. Uh, and the REF, for instance, in our world is very much an example of that. Uh, I think the other thing I would say is that when you do interdisciplinary work, the danger from the point of view of the humanities is always that it can get squeezed out. It's just in, in terms of its requirements, in terms of the amount of money it asks for, in terms of how much money is perceived to require, this is a very pragmatic point about institutions are set up, uh, it tends to need and require and ask for less money. So there's always a danger it gets squeezed out uh, or tagged on. Uh, to the other social sciences and sciences. Yeah, so it's a, a, a supplementary, um, mm. but, but that would bring us back to the, the question of, of the, the, the innate value of the humanities without the, its interdependency um, and, and whether we can find that. Sorry, Lauren, do you want to come back to, to Ben's point uh, uh, in, 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 in relationship to this, this, this issue of the, uh, is there an innate value to philosophy without any other discipline, I suppose, is, 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 is what um, I, I hear Ben saying. Yeah, I mean, on the practical point, we'll just, just change the way that we fund things. I mean, we can fix that problem if, you know, the, the problem is that, that these projects are, are, are practically complex because the funding mechanisms don't, doesn't fit sometimes, just change the mechanisms. Um, easier said than done. Um, but in terms of the, like, the innate value of the humanities, I guess we'd have to carve out what are the humanities? What distinguishes a hu humanistic study from something else? And um, if what characterizes humanities disciplines, uh, maybe I'd like to see what all three of you say to this um, proposal, but if it's that it's asking questions about kind of what I was saying a little bit before about what does it mean to be human? How should we live? How should we live as um, individuals who um, for most of our lives are dependent, vulnerable creatures that, that in some ways need to be around um, other people in, in yeah. quite dependent ways. What do we do? If those are the sort of questions that humanities asks, it seems would have to be answering those questions and anything that's not answering those questions would need to justify itself as well. And, and Francis, do you, you, you agree with this, that, 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 that it, it's about trying to understand what is human that comes distinctively in contribution of film does it does it does it enable us to to achieve that reflection i mean yeah i mean film d by definition does explore that question but i'm I've, i'm a little bit behind in that i'm still thinking about all of the infrastructural <laughs> issues that like all of the 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 leads that need to be cut in order to create this interdisciplinary um, 
communal living situation. Um, that, you know, I'm, in, I'm just thinking about publishers as well. You know, certain publishers will publish books in certain disciplines. But if your book is crosses disciplines, it's like, mm, no, we don't publish in, in, in both of those, so we can't publish it. You know, so there's, there's the publishing uh, as well. Journals as well are very much disciplinary based. So the whole infrastructure would need to, to be dismantled. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point in terms of what's the subjects that the students also sort of come to study are set within particular domains related to school and the formation of, of the modern university. Um, I've got a number of, of, of questions that are, that, are, that are also coming in and I want to sort of uh, make sure we have enough time to, to, to pick up some of these. There's a one from uh, Trevor here who's wanting to learn, um, asking Ben particularly, but we can widen this out, about how literature has helped propose solutions to the challenges that we may be facing. What are some examples of how we should be listening more to literary figures as we look for solutions to, or overcome the challenges to living in the current environment? Let, ben, do you want to pick up that uh, question? Well, I'm afraid I don't have uh, a silver bullet here. If I had the magic answer, I'd be a very wealthy man. Clearly what literature does is it provides us with alternative modes of living, of being, of realms of the imagination. It helps us think through how things could be different to how they are currently. Uh, but that can take various different forms and I'll try and give an answer tied to a specific uh, set of examples, namely uh, that of, well, that of existentialism. Since Lauren mentioned Simone de Beauvoir, I'll take that example. So you mentioned, Lauren, uh, the second sex, her most famous text. That's, of course, a philosophical text, perhaps a sociological text. It's not a, a work of the imagination. If we compare that to one of her novels, perhaps her most famous novel, uh, The Mandarins, which won the Prix Goncourt in 1953, I think, uh, it, what's interesting is to see how, necessarily, how much more embodied many of the same ideas, she wrote them around the same time, many of the same ideas are simply much more embodied, it seems to me, in that novel, in the characters in that novel. Uh, they come alive in a sense because one can identify them through the means of the narrative. There's this kind of, there's a sort of virtual reality machine at work here, which is the realm of the imagination, whether it's in film or literature or any other kind of art. Um, now, if we look sideways in that novel, as it happens, the Mandarins, it's, it's a homo clear, the characters are based on Simone de Beauvoir, her, her partner Sartre and Albert Camus, we mentioned them earlier. So everyone's thinking about Camus and the play. Everyone's reading that, or at least pretending to read that uh, and talking about that. Uh, and it's true, there's the obvious means, modes of relevance between that and our current situation. What's interesting, though, is that that was written during the war, and the plague is actually intended there as an allegory of Nazism. So there's a different kind of, of, of move there. It's the plague, not on its own terms, if you like, which is what we have now, I suppose, but the plague as a symbol, an allegory of something else, namely Nazi occupation. And the other interesting point is that what happens in that book is not a pandemic, it's an epidemic. And that's an important, very important distinction, I think. And we'll hold on to that, because in that book, the epidemic is, is limited to one town in Algeria, which can be quarantined, shut off from the rest of the world. Of course, the situation we're in now is that the, the, it, this is a pandemic, so by definition, it is everywhere. So it, there's a very different kind of almost epistemological position there. There's no position outside of the plague currently from which we can reflect on it, as there would be in the, in the situation in, in the play, in, in, in uh, Camus novel, because we can go outside the town and reflect on it from a kind of transcendental position. We don't have that currently. I almost want to say there's no, there's no uh, outside, il n'est pas de horreur peste, to speak with Derrida. There's no position outside of the play. Uh, so in a sense, just to finish on that very briefly, it seems to me our current lockdown situation is maybe even more comparable, not to Camus and la peste, but to Sartre and his play, Lui Clou, in which you may recall there are three characters in hell and they're locked in hell for eternity. And the famous statement, hell is other people, comes from that, uh, from that play. But in a sense, what we've also learned is that hell is the absence of other people. So I think we can use all those different ways of thinking about, um, about our situation, about the plague and about the lockdown, as just one example trying to answer the question uh, as to how literature can help us think through our current, um, our current travails. That, that's a useful answer given, given we have another, another question from Jamal Ludin who's asking about the existential question precisely and also raising this epistemological hesitation of being locked inside the present situation um, and, and whether we can look at the present situation from our present humanities. Uh, we are also locked in to a particular state because of where the humanities is. 
Lauren, existentialism seems to be the dominant philosophy coming through this question and, and the literary example from Ben um, and your own uh, introduction with Simone de Beauvoir. Um, is, is, is the existentialism providing us with the greater apparatus for understanding our condition? I find existentialism fascinating and I don't understand it fully. And that's partly why I find it so interesting. Um, if the, the main, if one of the main ideas is this tension between, um, I mean, the classic phrases are, you know, existence and essence. So, um, you know, essence in the sense of having a, a purpose that came from outside of you, existence being something like the fact that you just are here. Well, which comes first? Are we here? And then we go out and find a purpose. Do we have a purpose that we were sort of, I mean, it's not maybe helpful to use language like predestined, but that captures the idea, like a purpose that, you know, was, was there before we even were born. Um, and, um, I mean, whatever people think, if they agree with that as a, as a, a sense, the idea that, you know, we, we exist and then we go out and we, we create our purpose for ourselves or fulfillment for ourselves, um, in the kinds of activities that I, I see some people and, you know, talk to some of the students that have just kind of finished up this semester, um, uh, getting involved in activities that they kind of had wanted to do while busy with, with deadlines and, and, and semester work and now, you know, are really sort of reveling in, in some of the, the freedom that they, they might not have had during some stressful term time. I mean, um, I don't know about you, um, but my to-do list and my, my email inbox sets my purpose for me most of the time during my life. Um, and, and so having, I mean, not that any of that's stopped just yet, but you know, if we do have a chance in, um, at some point um, during this time to pause and, and remember that, you know, if the existentialists are correct, we do def sorry, um, define our purpose and set our purpose and we can always like, shut down the email. I mean, there's going to be consequences. That's the thing is that you have responsibility for the purpose that you set for yourself. Um, I think it's a huge, um, hugely kind of rich set of intersecting questions that existentialism poses for a time like this. Well, I, I guess there's also an, an, an issue there about the, the conditions by which we do the reflecting within. Um, I'm, I'm back to some of those economic questions, but, but I, I'm, I'm struck by an, another question from Daz Ling is asking, but what, what do you think of black lives and what should we do as a humanities to move forward in the new world after COVID-19. And of, of course, the situation currently in the United States has brought these issues together. And it raises a, pro a profound question about whether the humanities is fundamentally inclusive. Um, we've had discussion in, and Francis was talking about films um, coming from Hong Kong and the, 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 the kind of context may, may be uh, linked to that wider um, parts outside of the, uh, of the global north. And, and I'm just wondering about the inclusivity of philosophy and the inclusivity of literature and film in addressing some of these lives and, and how black lives are being represented sufficiently in the humanities, whether we need to reconstruct the curriculum in, in some way. Francis, do you want to come in on, on, on this issue? Um, because you were touching on it a little bit in terms of some of the Global South issues. Yeah, I mean, black li what do you think of black lives? Black lives matter. And what's interesting, though, is that this has been a discussion within the humanities for, you know, before this has come up well before uh, cor the coronavirus. And, you know, there is uh, a, a gesture within uh, the humanities to be more inclusive. And, you know, I think the, that the humanities has is in many ways too far behind, or can be too far behind in that curricula are often still struggling to get women in the, um, in the, uh, in the curriculum. And, you know, in my own discipline in film, you know, people will say, well, you know, film theory is all written by men. And of course, it's that film theory is written by men because that's who has been published and anthologized and historicized and, you know, and so it's like we need to unpick, go back and unpick those, um, 
those canons. And also, of course, you know, look at who's writing about these, these very uh, white male centric discourses. In terms of, I just want to sort of pick up on the, on the, um, the relationship, of course, of I don't actually think that what is going on in the United States and the coronavirus are such different questions. <laughs> Was, as we know, and I think one of the other uh, questions addressed this was this idea of, well, yes, you know, we're all sitting in our living rooms and in isolation and we're, you know, we're thinking about how can film and literature help us within isolation. Well, isolation is a privilege. You know, isolation is something that not all people can, can, can enter into. And, um, you know, so, and there has been, you know, in the suburbs in Paris, there there was incredible violence, from police violence that went on in the early weeks of the, of the lockdown. It doesn't, you know, uh, attract the headlines of the world, of the world press, but it's going on. You know, why? Because, you know, how can you put, uh, you, you know, living in such close quarters, it's just not possible. Um, and what was I going to say? But of course, we actually have really good, um, a very good precedence here, and that is, of course, with the Orange Revolution and the and the Arab Spring, where uh, you know people now have access to making movies. In that, you know, people have telephones. People have the camera is not something which is only given to the um, <coughs> to people who have. Um, of course, not everyone has it, but, you know, one step forward in all this is that video is capturing again and again and again uh, what is going on in the streets. And the more that, uh, that, 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 that kind of video footage is analysed, the more that kind of, you know, because we talk about the, the very first time that this, this kind of footage was entered into a courtroom was the Rodney King um, beating in 1992. Um, uh, and of course, uh, an all white jury acquitted the police the white policeman for killing the black man uh, in Los Angeles and then the Los Angeles riots uh, began. And we need, that's the first thing is, we need to take this footage seriously. We need to raise, uh, you know, in the humanities as the critics and, and commentators on this kind of footage, the more it is is understood for what it is, the more people know how to read an image. If, 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 if uh, as Francis indicated, needs to be taken more seriously, the inclusivity of black lives, and, and I also see in another question, uh, Ryan's asking about the male canon in literature as well. Uh, how, how is it possible to kind of shift the power dynamic in the humanities and, in, in, and create a new situation of a wider inclusivity of literature, a wider representation of, of, of black lives, of, of the lives of all of, the, of, of those who are excluded? I think, I, think it's, I think it's very difficult, but it's also very important. Uh, it's difficult because we are where we are. Whether we like it or not, we have this historical baggage of, of accumulated prejudice uh, and it, the, the answer to the old, uh, the old joke when someone asks for directions, the answer is, well, I wouldn't start from here, but here is where we are, uh, and we have to deal with that. Um, I think one example I would give in response to this is that it's, this is where, and listening to Francis has made me, made me really reflect on this, the role of, of the cultural critic is so important. Those of us who think of ourselves as comparatists reaching across several different nations, traditions, have an important role to play here, I think, and I'll give one example of this. Uh, I've, been, I've been running a scheme for the British Comparative Literature Association called Culture and Quarantine. We've had submissions from all over the world. And one of the most interesting was some colleagues in India talking about the fact that there in India, social distancing has always existed. It's called the caste system, the, the Dalits, the untouchables. And they've always had that, uh, that unfortunate uh, circumstance. And this is nothing new to them. So I think that I take that as, as, as an example all important on its own terms, but also as a way of showing that what the, what the humanities and what reflection on the humanities can do is show back to us our essential contingency. The fact that we are, like it or not, embedded in certain social structures, which bring with them certain prejudices, conscious and unconscious. And all we can do is to try and step back from those and reflect on them. But what we can't do is, is bootstrap 
ourselves in any kind of Kantian sense. We can't really step, ultimately step outside of ourselves. But we can try, we can try to do that, and we can do that by being self-conscious. And that's what the humanity is and what reflection and art and thought can help us do. But in any transcendental sense, that's going to be an awfully difficult thing to do. <clears throat> Lauren, I mean, in terms of philosophers becoming more inclusive, often the philosophical canon is seen as dead white males. How, how does it establish a, a, an altering to a more global and more inclusive uh, element to, to include black lives? Um, I mean, I forget the question went away because we started talking about it, but um, and I forget exactly how it was sorted. But the the answer was sort of you know what do we what do we do? I think the answer is like we stop being racist. Like I think it's just a simple. I mean, simple, but I mean like it's that stark to be said. Don't vote for people who have a history of saying racist things. Like you just end up. Um, and then in terms of philosophy and academia, kind of as a um, an institutionalized discipline. Um, listening to as many voices as possible and making, um, what's the word, um, so practical uh, steps and practical um, changes after listening to two people. Um, and I, I think we haven't at all mastered the listening to say anything more than that. So, so it's, back, it's back to the sort of the, crit the critical voice of the humanities to, to, to raise awareness of the, the, the issues in, in, in one sense. That's the value of the humanities, to ask questions and to resist, to go back to what we were saying earlier, to resist this idea that everything has to be about, about making money, about advancing, advancing sort of certain agendas. The humanities and the arts precisely uh, can, can ask those questions and can resist that idea of instrumentalization. That's one of the traditional defenses of the humanities. It's one of the traditional definitions of beauty, isn't it? For its own sake, something that has value on its own. And I think the humanities inherit that legacy. And, 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 in, and in one sense, that, that's, that's a, le a legacy of, of wisdom in the philosophical tradition, Lauren. Yep. With, um, wisdom wisdom is, is precisely uh, uh, about this critical awareness. Isn't it? Well, I think you've frozen for a second. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's the order, the order, are we doing, you know, have we, do, do we have, a, I mean, I guess the language would be, do we have an agenda that we're then doing this research in order to justify, or do we have a, an open-ended um, inquiry that will inform what we do in response to that um, is, yeah, very important. I'm aware we've only got five minutes left and um, more questions than we will have uh, time to fully respond to, but I'm going to pick up um, one question here from Joanna on the economic value. We touched on this a little earlier. Is the economic value of the creative arts, literature, visual, music, properly appreciated, especially in the way it supports mental health and resilience? And I guess in, in a period of COVID and, and issues of mental health and being aware of our mental health, which has become a, a, a dominant issue in the British media, I mean, clearly the humanities is, is, is vital in that, in, in, in that respect. Francis, do you, do, do you have a view on that one? I do, in so far as the answer is no. I mean, it was, the, the question the question is, you know, is it is the is its economic value? No, you know, and I mean, I think one of the things that artists and filmmakers um, are struggling with is once you put everything online, then how are you going to um, how are you going to live? you know, because you're not selling your work if it's freely accessible online. And, you know, it depends, of course, what, you know, how, uh, what sort of channels they're making money through, whether it's selling in an art gallery or um, through uh, distribution of film, etc. So I, I think the economic value begins with the economic value of the artist and filmmaker. And then, of course, uh, only then, when the work is being produced and, and artists and, and, and filmmakers are being paid, um, can we, as the humanities scholars, then, you know, I, and this sort of uh, is appends to the previous discussion in that it's not just that we as scholars need to be inclusive. I think it's also about enabling us enabling students that by default are inclusive. I mean, as a generation, of course, that not of course, but I, there is more inclusivity, but it's, it's also about facilitating that, uh, you know, facilitating making helping to, to create 
young gen uh, the next generation to break with the these sorts of stringent um you know yeah. The, the, the skills that it provides uh, for, for the future is, is coming through. I, I, we've only got a few minutes. I'm going to come to Ben and then and Lawrence have finished. In, in, in terms of this question of the importance of mental health and resilience that the, the, the creative arts provides. Ben, do you want to come in on, 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 on how you see the... Well, I, I just wanted to say really in response to that question and to the previous one, that in a sense, the answer is in the question. I think if we, if we merely appreciate and value the humanities and the arts in economic terms, then we have a problem. And that one of the, one of the, one of the purposes of the arts is precisely to resist, it seems to me, that way of valuing things. It's that other things matter beyond simply making money. Uh, and that then is a way of answering the mental health question too, because it's a case of what you value and what gives you meaning, purpose and structure in your life. I think that we don't want to be a society, to, to paraphrase Wilde, that knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Yeah, th thank you, Ben. And Lauren, I saw you were nodding uh, as Ben was speaking <laughs> in terms of this, if we look at it only in the economic. Yeah, I think, I mean, just maybe just to, to link it back to Oscar Wilde again for a nice sort of, um, Symmetry. Um, one of the lines in that that essay that I was um, referring to at the beginning, um, it it's sort of again getting backwards um, the solutions and the problems, and like in, instead of having a problem that keeps happening and we just keep fixing the problem, um, what are the conditions and the, the sort of infrastructure we can put in place to avoid the, the the problem being a problem in the first place? Like it's kind of useless to just keep fixing it, rather set up a, a society that it makes it impossible for those problems to occur. I think that's. Um, uh, good way forward. Thank you. And as you say, a nice symmetry kind of bring, bring the discussion of the humanities to a conclusion. Unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time, but there are also responses to questions that have already come up. We, we, we've registered some of those on, on the Q&A and hopefully we can pick them up. Can I say thank you to Ben, Francis and Lauren for a great discussion. So much more we could talk about here, but I, th but I think a clear sense of the changing nature of the humanities and the importance to values and our critical thinking for the future. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you for all the questions. We're out of time, but you can join us again on the 11th of June for the next webinar in, in Out, Shake It All About, uh, Brexit and the UK-Norway comparison. And also, um, Ben is following up this week the MA Festival of U U Unite. Um, do you want to say a little bit there before we close? Yes, thank you, Jeremy. Really following on a lot of the questions we've been discussing today, uh, our MA students are running their end of year festival, starting to today to tomorrow, continuing all through the week. Tomorrow is a day of a work conference, academic conference, academic papers and discussion around those papers. Wednesday follows on from that with the launch of this year's student magazine, The Monteur. Thursday, we'll uh, have a film festival and an art workshop. And Friday, finally, we'll conclude the week with an open mic gathering on Friday evening. All of this and more, all the details about this can be found on the website, which you can see on the screen in front of you. And the overall topic of the thesis, as you can see, is Unite Rebel. So really following on from a lot of these things we've been discussing surrounding the purpose, the value of the arts and humanities and everything I hope that the students uh, have learned over their year in Paris to that end. Great. Thank you, Ben. Do join the festival online and do join our next webinar on the 11th of June in out and shake it all about Brexit and the Norway, UK Norway comparison. Thank you to Lauren. Thank you to Francis. Thank you to Ben. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>